There we go. We're having a few technical challenges, so we'll be continuing to work on that while we get the program going. Welcome to meeting 5322 of Rotary Club of San Jose. I want to welcome any guests and, of course, all of you members. Would you bring your guests up to this microphone and introduce them, please, if you have a guest today? Please bring the guest with you. And guests, uh, and guests, if you uh, would like to introduce yourself, uh, you, you can do that, but it only take about five seconds, please. Is that Irma? Hi, Irma. Welcome, welcome, Tiffany. Hi, Chris. So Chris Burrow is my guest today. Chris is, uh, manages the Hammer Theater. I don't know what his official title is. He'll tell you in a second. But we've become uh, friends over the last couple of years. And if you haven't been to the Hammer Theater, you should go more often. Chris, give everybody a little bit about yourself. Welcome, Chris. Sarju, come on up. Oh, Bonnie, I'm sorry. Aww. You know, if you didn't know better, you would think Marv's a member because he actually comes here far more often than many of our members. So if you're you're listening on Zoom. Come on, come on back and visit us. Sarju. Welcome. Morris, come on over here. Good afternoon, Morris Chubb. I am part of the Unhoused Impact Committee. And tomorrow at 8 a.m., we have John Sobrato Sr. coming to talk to us about what he is doing for the unhoused. I don't know if you know this or not, but John Sobrato Sr. and his foundation outgives Google, Apple, LinkedIn, etc. cetera, to the, to the unhoused. So this is going to be a great meeting. There is a QR code card on your tables. I thought you could capture the, the uh, the QR code and then in your phone and then use it? Apparently not. I, I'm, I guess I'm techno technologically uh, challenged. There are a few cards around. I brought 20. If there are people who need it, I've got a few more. There's, there's one on each table. If there's more that needs it, uh, you know, just write on the back of it, write your, your email address, and I'll send you the code. Thank you very much. Thank you, Morris. Morris and uh, my friend Brian Franklin. Is Brian here? Where's Brian? Oh, Brian. Uh, they uh, took over this committee for me a couple years ago, so I, I'm deeply indebted to both of them for liberating me. But uh, if you want to go to that meeting and you're confused, just send one of them an email and they'll send you the Zoom link for tomorrow. Uh, come on up. Uh, Alfredo Bacari and Debbie Caminiti, if you're here. Alfredo, come on up. I think Debbie might be on Zoom. I am. Are you able to hear me? So Alfredo is one of our new members. He's going to give you a brief introduction about himself. Welcome, Alfredo. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. And um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Debbie and uh, Cindy, to invite me to this uh, group. And uh, my name is Alfredo. I've been, uh, came, I came in USA 20 years ago. I'm from South Italy, Calabria. I've been in Rome for 18 years and uh, 21 years here in San Jose. I'm an architect. I have my own company. I have a beautiful daughter. Oh. She loves me tomorrow less. Uh, and uh, I live in Bologna nearby. And 
Yeah, also, Alfredo, you need to meet Dick Vasili at some point. He's one of your countrymen. He's right there. You can shake his hand as you're walking by. Uh, Debbie Caminiti. Debbie, are you on the Zoom? I am, but we're having technical difficulties, I think. Uh, I think we can hear you. Debbie, you want to go ahead and talk about yourself? Awesome. About myself or about Alfredo? Oh, whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I, I thought I was going to introduce Alfredo. Um, we've been friends for over 10 or 12 years. We originally met at a, at a little kind of fundraiser. And um, we even entered this little competition. President Steve, I think you know about the confluence together. Um, Alfredo is a very uh, creative person, um, a very uh, driven person. And I thought he'd be a great fit for. Debbie, may I, may I interrupt you for a moment? Yeah. Could everyone on Zoom make sure you're muted if you aren't already? We're getting some strange feedback in the room. Go ahead, Debbie. Um, so Alfredo is a very creative and driven person, and I thought he'd be a perfect fit for Rotary um, to be able to roll up his sleeves and get involved with all the community involvement that we all get ourselves into. So welcome, Alfredo. Thanks. Uh, Catherine Vandiver, are you here somewhere? Come on up. Catherine's one of our COVID cohort members that she came in uh, during Fernando's time. And uh, so now we get a chance to see her and she's going to talk to all of you. Hi, everyone. Just a quick introduction. I know students is fast, so I'll make it quick. Uh, Catherine Vandiver, I grew up in San Jose, having been born in San Francisco. I'm a graduate of San Jose State in computer engineering. I was one of the first, I was one of the first uh, students to graduate with that program and I'm exceptionally proud of that fact. At that time we had about 35 women in engineering. And today, as you know, that uh, has really depleted to around 11%. So I do everything that I can to encourage women to go into this field in particular. Um, I, after graduating, I did the Silicon Valley tour. I was with Hewlett Packard, Apple, Sun Microsystems, Netscape, VMware, Intel for a short while, and then I went into a whole bunch of startups where I found my zen, so I'm absolutely loving it. Um, and that's pretty much about me, and here I am today, so thanks again. If you're a red badger in the room and there's a card in front of you that has the letter M or N or T on it, come on up, I've got a bottle of wine for you. Anybody, red badgers? There's one. There's two, there's three, excellent. And thank you, Bert. Leslie's got something to say. Come on up, Leslie. Hi, Steve. You can go back to the podium now. I'm going to go back to the podium. I'll do my best, Brian Adams. Uh, Blue badge, Kathy Collin. Kathy, are you here? Kathy? Come on up. We spent a lot of time up here today, I guess. And next up is going to be Tu Do. Tu, are you here? Come on, come on up. Yeah, give her a round of applause. So two dough. Uh, I 
If you don't know too, you should get to know her. Uh, she does incredible work and she's gonna tell you a story about uh, Roy Russell's school. Any of you who know Roy know he was a top-notch uh, Rotary member for decades and decades and many of us loved him. So too, it's all yours. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, President Steve. Make sure I have this. How do I get this slide up on the big screen? So how do I make it bigger? <laughs> oh, okay. So I will just go with the little tiny screen and I hope you can see. Um, well, um, today I'm very happy to report to you on the fundraising effort uh, for the school construction in Vietnam to honor Roy Russell. And, well, first, let me tell you about the International Feast on Friday, October 1st at the Gordon House. 81 guests came to the event. This number is beyond our expectation. The evening was very fun. There was plenty of international dishes, and the guests were treated with lobsters from Maine, brought to us by uh, Roy's daughter, Miss Lone Russell, and the guests were entertained by a very unique musical program performed by Miss Vân Anh Lo, the uh, Emmy Award winner, uh, who played modern music on the Vietnamese traditional instrument. I am going to go through many photos taken by Kathleen Thomas. I hope you still can see them, the little tiny one. But we have many nice photos that show many happy faces of the people who were there um, at the event. So I'll just click through these photos very quickly. I hope you recognize your friends and yourself. There is no music and I'm not going to talk much during this um, slideshow. You still can see your friends up here, right? See, everyone have a uh, big smiles on their face. While you are looking at these pictures, I would like to take this opportunity to, um, uh, on behalf of the ISC, the International Service Committee, Hey, you can see them. I like um, Terry in this picture. You see, she really enjoyed the lobster. <laughs> um, I'd like to take this opportunity to speak on behalf of the International Service Committee to, thank, to send our thanks to the following people who contribute and um, to make this a very successful event. Um, Bert George for the wine. Sloan Russell for the lobsters from Maine, Ms. Vân Anh Võ for the musical program, President Steve for sponsoring the tickets for the San Jose State students, all the uh, Rotary staff who support the uh, before and after the events, and all the guests who came and all the donors who make a financial contribution. Uh, thank you all of you for those. And um, you see Võ Vân Anh? Okay, so with that is a, one of the activity to raise funds for the school construction in Vietnam. The revenue of this project came from four different sources. VN Help, the nonprofit organization that I manage, San Jose State, I mean, um, uh, this club and the district, and the admission tickets uh, from the international fees that you just saw from the pictures, and from several generous individual donors. And with this um, amount of money that we have raised, we can build a school in this village in the mountainous areas of Sơn La province. The village have 11,000 people, and this is the school they have right now. These are three classrooms, and this is the condition, uh, the current condition of the school. You see inside the classroom, it's very unsafe and very 
are not suitable for the students. So our project will build an elementary school in this mountainous area. We will build four new classrooms, one teacher room, and two restrooms for boys and girls. And we will also repair and renovate the, the classroom that you saw. So at the end, when we finish this project, the school will have seven classrooms to serve 200 elementary students. So what is our plan? We will, uh, I will go ahead and make the plan to execute this project. The project will take four months to complete. The first month is for all the legal papers and uh, contracts and permits, and then three months to um, actually construct the uh, buildings. And at the end of the project, when, when the construction is done, there will be a big ceremony, um, ribbon cutting, grand opening. It's very festive. The entire village and parents and students and government officials will come to the event. And some of the Rotarians already expressed interest to go on the trip to Vietnam to attend this um, um, ceremony. So I will make a plan and inform you of the plan so that if you are interested in joining us in this uh, fun and meaningful trip, uh, we can go together. All right, so VN Help and the Rotary Club of San Jose have been partners since 2008. And this school construction project is a 13 project that we co-fund and we work together. Um, we, we, we really appreciate the partnership. And uh, if I have uh, one more minute, I would like to share with you a news. Uh, this is uh, on a different subject. Um, if you know Thang Do, the Rotarian who I sponsored uh, to this club in 2012, um, since May of this year, he no longer has come to the club because he was um, diagnosed with lung cancer. Uh, even though he doesn't come, but he still thinks of you very often. And uh, he liked me to share this news with you. Because on October 23rd, uh, the Vietnamese American Service Center was open in the corner of Tully and Story Road. It's a 37,000 square foot um, building and uh, it's funded by the Santa Clara County, $50 million. And Thang Do is the main architect to design that building. Thang sent you this message. The Vietnamese American Service Center has been a very special project for me as an architect. It gave me a unique opportunity to work with my Vietnamese American community and to pay homage to the cultural tradition of my homeland, Vietnam. The design of the center is infused with forms, materials, textures, and colors that represent Vietnamese history, landscape, and people. My hope is that my fellow American, uh, my fellow Vietnamese Americans will find a sense of home in this center and that non-Vietnamese people will be introduced to Vietnamese culture through its architecture. Please make a visit when you have a chance. I wish I could present this project in person but my health condition had forced me to leave Rotary. I hope that this is just a temporary setback and I will return to this club and other community activities that I truly love. So that's from Thang Do. He asked me to pass this message to all of you. Well, thank you for listening. And I'm looking forward to present to you more meaningful results of our project. Thank you, thank you very much for your support. That's a good reminder of why we're in Rotary. <clears throat> and everybody, <clears throat> Thang is a wonderful guy. If you don't know him, uh, you should get to, get to know him. And, and uh, Thang, if you're listening, uh, uh, our best to you uh, the, from everyone in the club. Uh, Nancy Williams wanted me to mention to everyone that the gala committee needs help. Please join the committee if you're so inclined. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and they do wonderful work. Uh, Janica Clem, come on up and introduce today's speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Janica Clem. Nice to see you all. Well, here we are. We are building the world's most experienced driver. This is what Waymo is focused on and what our illustrious speaker is here to speak about. Michelle Peacock is the head of uh, policy 
sorry, public policy for Waymo, the autonomous vehicle company founded by Google. Michelle's career has centered on building and growing government relations programs for large, small, established, and startup companies in financial services, high tech, and transportation. Prior to Waymo, Michelle established and ran government relations for Turo, the world's largest peer-to-peer -peer car sharing company from 2015 to 2020. She accomplished a tremendous track record of success, including legislative initiatives in 43 states. Michelle has also been instrumental in setting up GR programs for companies like eBay and then later PayPal, and she's also led state government relations for Cisco and Microsoft. Michelle has many ties to San Jose. She is a former board chair of the San Jose Chamber of Commerce, and she served with me on the Chamber uh, Foundation Board. She lives in Willow Glen, and her and her family can be found making trips to SAP to cheer on the San Jose Sharks. It is my pleasure to introduce Michelle Peacock. Excellent. Oh. Awesome. Great. Um, hi, everybody. Sorry about the delay. It's so great to be here. And thank you so much for welcoming me today. Um, as Janica said, I'm Michelle Peacock. I'm with Waymo, which is the um, leading autonomous vehicle technology company. Um, I'm really particularly happy to be here today because my wonderful husband, Chris Peacock, has joined me. Hi, honey. Um, and um, I thought what we would do is um, this is a brand new, exciting uh, technology for, for everyone around the world. And I thought I'd just walk through a little bit about Waymo and our history and our mission and just sort of show you some of the technology that we are using um, and some of the applications. And um, I think if you have questions at the end, we'd be, be happy to, to share those. So, oh, in the slide. there we go. So we say we're building the world's most experienced driver. Um, the, the company that we um, are, are my, my company Waymo has built the suite of software and hardware that applies to a base model car. And, um, and in doing that, creates an opportunity to get people and things where they need to go fast and safely. Um, and that is the mission that drives everything that we do. Um, and the future, the, the promise of this technology is pretty, is pretty remarkable. Um, and I say that because I think something that we all know is that, you know, basically humans are terrible drivers. Um, there are 50 million injuries and sadly 1.35 million deaths every year in this world um, that are caused by traffic accidents. And the, the people that, the, and a statistic I just recently learned is that 50% of those are people who aren't even in the car. They're just road users, vulnerable road users like pedestrians or motorcyclists or cyclists. Um, and the reason why, um, you know, we see these uh, traffic accidents be so um, dramatic is because um, that humans are not such great drivers. Um, I was thinking about asking for a show of hands, if any, but I don't want to get to the bottom of this list and have people have to say if they've ever driven under the influence, so we'll skip that part. Um, but I can say personally that, you know, while I try really hard to be a focused driver on the road, I am often playing with my Sirius XM radio. Um, I'm talking to someone, one of my passengers. Sometimes I'm actually on the phone. I try not to text and drive. Um, but you know, humans are, are, are imperfect when it comes to this. And, um, and it's the, the, this is what's causing those uh, fatalities and injuries. And we believe that autonomous technology can really go a long, long way in saving lives. So our experience with with this technology is quite extensive. Um, we, I believe, have driven more than any other AV company. Um, we have over 20 million miles driven with a human behind the wheel um, auto and, and autonomously um, and 20 billion miles in simulation and have done this across 25 cities. And altogether, that's a thousand years of human driving experience and it benefits every vehicle in the fleet that we have. Um, so I want to just walk you through a little bit more about that technology and why we think how we started developing it and why. So at the beginning of the company, we were the Google self-driving car project and that um, and started to evaluate, like, how could we create a self-driving car that would benefit the world and developed a first prototype and shared it with our employees. And the employees were asked to take test drives in these cars 
and, um, and then give us some feedback. And so what we learned in that process was, was actually terrifying. Um, I don't have a full video to show you, but here's a picture. And you can see this, this is one of the, there, I, the video shows four examples. There's a guy who is texting while driving. There is a guy who is plugging in his laptop while driving. There's a woman who's putting on her makeup while driving. And this guy who is actually asleep. And every one of those people is driving in a car that they were told it has driver assist technology. You have to stay alert. You have to keep your hands on the wheel. And the minute they got in the car and felt that car start to like keep itself in the lane, they just checked out. They just checked out. And so this was the thing that was really, really scary for, for us to, to learn. And it supports this idea that humans just are human and are not able to keep maintain that level of focus and attention that is required for safe driving. So what we decided to do is pivot our business from scaling up AV from things like cruise control and then increasingly more sophisticated levels of automation. We decided to pivot from scaling to focusing just on here, it's the, where it says level four automation. If afterward you all wanna do a deep dive on the Society of Automotive Engineers levels of automation, I'm happy to walk you through that. But the big takeaway here is that that line down the middle on the left, on the white category, that is driver assist technology. That's what Tesla autopilot is. You have to maintain control of the car and stay hyper vigilant. On the blue side, high automation is um, where no driver is required. And so the company pivoted to focus on no driver required and skipping all of those other levels. And, um, and, in, and in doing that, it had a really profound impact on our business and they were able to, to take off. And so this is a picture of the very first prototype car. Um, it's adorable. It's called the Firefly. It's so cute. And you can see the man in the car is the very first person to ever take a ride in an autonomous vehicle on public roads. His name is Steve Mahan, and he is visually impaired. And, you know, I like to talk about Steve because this is the reason why autonomous vehicles exist. They can give access to people who have difficulty with transportation. Um, I was thinking about my mother this morning. Um, in fact, I'm wearing her necklace because I was thinking about her. And she, at the end of her life, could no longer drive, and she needed to go to the doctor a lot. And her, her attitude was, I'm not, I'm not getting in a taxi. I'm not taking Uber or Lyft. I don't know who that is. I don't know where they're taking me. I am not doing that. And okay, Connie, you're, you know, you got a lot of opinions. That's cool. Um, but I think about her all the time because this is the kind of product that would have helped her have that rich life toward the end of her life when she no longer, she would feel safe. She would feel like she would get to the place that she needed to go, get her medical care, see her family members much more easily and simply and be more independent in control of her life. Um, I wish she was around to see this. I think she would be really, really excited and she probably would have you know, fought Steve Meehan for the opportunity to be the first person. Um, and so, you know, moving on, um, that was the beginning of the company. In 2016, we spun out of Google, out of the Alphabet business, and became Waymo, our own independent company, outside board of directors, outside investors. Um, and we really started to focus on building the Waymo driver, um, which is what we call the suite of technology. So, uh, um, so the Waymo driver is just how we talk about um, our autonomous tech. And it is a technology stack that has hardware and software and is upfitted to a base model car. And so those, so we're not building, we're no longer building the adorable Firefly. We are partnering with um, uh, automakers to buy cars from them and then outfit those cars with this tech. So the first car um, that we did with this new format, as you can see here on the far left, is the Chrysler uh, Pacifica minivan. Um, and that is a, 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 was our first model that we did this with. The second one is the Jaguar Land Rover I-Pace, which you can see right there. And then the same technology can also work with class eight trucking and our delivery vans. And you can see them over here, well, sort of on the blue, the blue truck and the blue van. Um, and the idea is that as these cars are driving on the road and taking in more information and more data, they can use it to perfect the autonomous technology and so because that is a shared technology foundation across all of these platforms, all of the platforms, bet all of the different cars and their um, base models will benefit from that experience. 
So I'll just talk quickly about the technology here. Um, it is in two pieces, hardware and software, as we've been talking about. Um, starting with the hardware, this is a, a bird's eye view of the uh, Jaguar I-PACE. And it is, um, you can see, I don't have animation and I'm sorry, but normally it's pulsing and it looks really, really cool. Um, there, we use three kinds of sensors to take in information to help uh, the car and the, uh, the autonomous technology work. We use um, LIDAR, cameras, and radar. Um, LIDAR is, and I, if, there's, if there's light engineers in this room, please don't call me out on this as I'm not an engineer, but my understanding is that it shoots out photons and, it, the, and the photons bounce back. They is measured by a laser, laser and it helps create a three-dimensional picture of objects around the car. So they use that combined with the cameras and combined with radar to create this picture um, of what is going on in the environment around the car up to three football fields away and 360 degrees um, around the car. It's pretty spectacular. Um, looking at the software, what's cool about the, so the software is that it asks and answers four important questions. So the first question is for the car, where am I? And you can see here, here's the car down at the bottom and it's coming to an intersection and it is, it, it, this car is driving around and it's saying, okay, that's a crosswalk, that's a curb, that's a stop sign, that's a stop light, that's a park bench, that's a dog, that's a person, uh, that's a wheelchair, that's a scooter. So it's walking around, it's labeling things and, and identifying what they are so that as the car goes back and moves through that space again, it will already have an idea of what is in place. And then the software asks this question, which is, what is around me? And so then it starts this, uh, strengthening this labeling project. They will say, oh, these are cars that are, that are around me, and these cars are stopped, or they're, station, they're stationary, or they're moving. And if they're moving, they're moving at this speed. And they're moving at this speed in this lane, and that seems like what it should be doing. Or it's moving at a different speed in the wrong lane, and that's not what it's supposed to be doing. And it con conducts that assessment and senses what's happening in fractions of a second over and over and over again. And then it uses that information to say, what is gonna happen next? And so here you can see the car is predicting that the car that is motionless, zero miles an hour, um, 60 feet away, is predicting that it is gonna go through the intersection when the light turns green. And you can see that the car on the upper left that says five miles an hour, 65 feet away, it's in the lane that would be a left-hand turn lane and it appears that that car is gonna continue to turn left. So the car, the, the software technology uses the mapped area, what it senses is around it, and now it's predicting what these other actors are going to do. And then it says, what should I do? And it makes the plan for that car. So in this intersection, the car has already mapped the area, identified what's around, predicted what those other actors are going to do, and then has made its own plan. I, this car is going to turn left, make an unprotected left-hand turn that is safe because it has already done all of these calculations. Um, it's, the software is remarkable. I just saw a video of an unprotected left-hand turn where the traffic in the opposite direction was merging from two lanes to one, then to into the lane that it was in. And, the, and it worked as seamlessly as a very alert human driver could have possibly done it. It is pretty remarkable technology. And so with this great suite of technology, we can you know, sort of start to think about what, how can we reimagine tran trans uh, transportation? Um, we have two lines of business that we're focused on at Waymo. Uh, Waymo One, which is a robo-taxi ride-hailing business, and Waymo Via, which is our goods transportation uh, business. Um, starting with Waymo One, um, starting in uh, April of 2017, um, we invited members of the public in Chandler, Arizona to start to take rides in these cars that were still in the testing mode. And we were very excited to see um, it launched a year ago, a fully commercial, fully driverless ride hailing business in Chandler, Arizona. So today you could go to Chandler and if anybody has trips to Arizona anytime soon, you should definitely do this. You download the app on your phone and you summon a car just like you would Uber or Lyft. And the car shows up and it, to pick you up and take you where you're going. And there is no one in that car. It is an empty car. And then you get into the back seat of the car and there's a little screen that will greet you. And the screen just gives you information. Here's the route we're taking. 
It shows you a picture of what the car is seeing around it using that LIDAR and cameras and radar. Um, and it'll, you can, you know, it'll play music for you. You can plug in your phone, you can use YouTube music, you can use whatever you want, and you get safely um, on the other side um, of your ride. And the, the thing that is that I've heard, I have, I'm going to take my first ride next week. Thank you, COVID. It's been a, a crazy time. I haven't been able to get into one of these cars. Um, but that what I understand from folks who have done this is that when the car shows up and you get in, it is a little scary and, uh, and very exciting. And then the car starts driving you to your destination and it gets boring really fast because it's just a car following the rules of the road, sticking to the speed limit, signaling, changing lanes, and taking you where you need to go. And you know, from where I sit, that's the goal, right? Let's have that be a really boring, safe ride getting you to where you need to go. Um, I had a little video here. Unfortunately, it's not gonna work for us today, but this is a, you know, pictures and um, images of people taking rides. And it, it, it's that same exact thing. They're like, oh, that went by fast. That was really cool. Um, and I think it's interesting to imagine a way of, you know, a new way of having transportation where, you know, you can reclaim some time and you can reclaim some time with your family members, with friends or alone. And it isn't a shared car with a human driver that you don't know. And there's some benefit, but I think there's definitely some benefit to that. Um, here's a picture of the Jaguar I-PACE that is um, currently running routes in San Francisco. We, um, a few months ago, opened up what we call our trusted tester program. So members of the public can take rides in this car and give feedback to Waymo about their experiences. We wanna make sure there is a really strong commercially viable uh, program um, for, for our, our customers. And, and San Francisco, as you may know, is a unique place that has some uh, quirks to it. And we wanna make sure we're trying to address as many of those as possible. Um, and so if you would make it up to San Francisco and you see one of these, that is what you are, are seeing. And then um, the other line of business we have is Waymo Via, which is our class eight trucking and goods delivery business. Um, we are currently focused on this I-10 corridor. Um, this is where a lot of the AV, uh, class eight truck businesses are focused um, along the southern route there. It is you know, viewed as a you know, safer route um, with less weather issues to have to deal with. Um, we currently have some uh, small testing going on in the Bay Area. We have a hub in Dallas um, and are you know, running these routes along this corridor, um, mostly uh, around Texas right now and through to um, Arizona and New Mexico. Um, we are not doing running routes with goods in California yet. California needs to make a law change for us to be able to do that. Um, and then we also have our goods delivery. Um, I don't, oh, this video is working great. Um, where we are using the, uh, the Waymo One car platform to deliver goods for um, partners that are interested in, in doing more local small goods delivery. The interesting thing about this though, is especially during COVID, we have all been trained that the person who is driving the delivery van is gonna get out and take that box and walk it to the front steps. And here in this, there is no driver. So we have to retrain some of our customers to be on alert for when that uh, car is, is arriving with their goods and they have to go out themselves and get it. We'll see how that works. I don't know, people seem a little much, they like they have the high touch uh, experience. And so um, we are doing this currently in Arizona with a couple of partners, um, UPS and Auto Nation, where we're helping um, just shuttle goods back and forth for to different UPS depots and for AutoNation helping to deliver auto parts um, when, they, when they need those. Um, and we do that in autonomous fashion. So those are our commercial businesses. And I just wanna say thank you for inviting me here today and I'd be delighted to take any questions. A reminder, red badgers, you have a pass. You get to go to the front of the line if you'd like to ask questions, whether it's this week or next week or any time while I'm up here. So during the next year, you can always come up and do that. <laughs> With that, Janica is going to manage the questions. Thank you, Steve. Wow, what a pass. I didn't get that in my red right badger. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's start with, uh, um, people are curious about how uh, riders will pay, what the fee basis is, and then also um, privacy protections while you're in the rights. So uh, as far as the, the fee, that is still TBD. 
Um, you know, we are trying to be really competitive and offer a really luxurious experience um, with um, for somebody in that car. Um, but I think if you were to sort of gauge it, it would not be like a five star Michelin dinner expensive. And it wouldn't be, you know, jack in the box expensive. It would be right like a Starbucks drink expensive. So that's kind of how to think about where we're aiming our um, where we're aiming our pricing. But it has not been set yet for for the area and privacy. On, on privacy, meaning their, inform, their information, which information? I think that it's really kind of gearing towards um, how to protect. The, the question is just protections for for riders and drivers. So I'm I'm going to make the assumption that unless it's something different, type it into the chat. That if you were in the ride, sort of, you know, are there cameras on you? Are there privacy protections? I know that if you use other um, app-based mm -hmm. uh, transportation, there are privacy um, measures involved in using that app. Mm -hmm. But if there's anything you can see too. Yeah. So we, um, you know, we want our riders to be safe in the car, um, and so we do have a way for them to communicate with us, and um, and that would be, you know, if they summon assistance um, by using that touch screen in the front, where they can we can engage with them. Um, you know, we're not we're, we're not recording people inside of the car unless it's a video for my purposes. And um, as far as externally, you know, we do take in a lot of data out in the community, but none of it is personally identifiable. We are saying that's a person. We're not saying what person. Um, we look at their the position of their head to know the direction of their gaze so that we can predict what is going to happen. But we are not saying, oh, that's you know, Danica's face. That is just, it's just a face. That every Wednesday and Thursday, Danica goes to the bar no, we don't. and comes back. We don't do Good that. to know. We don't do that. Okay, up next, please. So, sorry, the question was, uh, is Waymo um, driving in San Jose right now and what um, uh, car partners are you working with? They can't hear on the mic. That, no, that's fine. So the, the car partners we're working with right now, um, you saw here the Chrysler Pacifica, um, so the Stellantis company, and the um, Jaguar Land Rover for the I-PACE. Our other partner is Daimler for the Class 8 trucking. Um, so those are our automotive partners at the moment. And then um, as far as San Jose, I mean, believe me, I would love to have uh, the uh, Waymo be operating in San Jose. We are not yet. Um, the, the path that we chose is one to take to tackle like the most difficult thing that we can do and if we can make that work well then it's much easier to deploy in, in more simpler domains as you all probably know san francisco is one of the more complex operating domains and geographies that you could conduct a business like this in so they're putting a lot of focus on understanding what is involved with san francisco with the idea ultimately that co uh, communities that are less complex will be a lot easier for us to enter so, so thank you so another question um so now that you guys are an independent company do you think there will be any brand rebranding will waymo maintain the name any sort of change there and then also will there be any change inside the car will we ditch the driver's seat or any of that so as a company then in, in the car. Uh, so we are, we're not at this moment, we don't have plans to ditch the driver's seat or the steering wheel or any of those things. Some of our competitors are taking that stuff, but we still think it's important to have the option to move a car manually if necessary. So we will, um, that will remain in the car for the time being. Um, the name and rebranding. Oh, the name. Or... So we, when we spun out of the Google self-driving car project, we became Waymo and we are keeping that and that is, we are Waymo forever. Thanks. Really quickly, and then on to Richard. Um, who are your other major competitors? So the one that you might see most often in the news is Cruise. Um, they are a, G a General Motors company, um, and they are doing some driving in San Francisco right now too. That's probably the biggest one. Neuro is another on the um, on the trucking side. Uh, too Simple, Embark, Kodiak. Thank you. Thank you. So we're doing a lot with public education right now. Sorry, the question was about marketing and, and usage of the, the vehicles. Usage of Yeah. 
So I think the they're, the the Waymo is not closing the door to anything. I, our focus right now is on this robo taxi business, our ride hailing business, and then goods delivery with the trucking side. So that's we, is a fleet that we will own and operate. And at the moment, that's what we're focused on. Um, in terms of finding our customers, we are doing a lot in public education um, with a, a campaign called uh, Let's Talk Autonomous Driving. I invite you all to take a look at that and maybe sign up to get updates. Um, and just trying to like familiarize people with what uh, what it means to be in an autonomous car, what are the benef life saving benefits of having that deployed in the community to sort of have uh, people understand what it is. And then when it becomes available as a commercial product, you'll see a lot more marketing to promote it. Sure. Deanna's question is around um, environmental impacts. If there's, uh, they're looking at electric vehicles and sort of how to decarbonize this yes. this new technology. So um, thank you for raising that question. It is really um, something that a lot of people at Waymo care deeply about. Um, our sustainability team. Um, is digging deep into how we can best reduce our carbon footprint uh, across the board. There are some challenges with that because, for example, there are no electric class A trucks. They're just, they don't exist yet. So, you know, for the community to put pressure on the truck manufacturers to pivot in that direction would be tremendous. Um, we are really proud to say that um, the Jaguar I-Pace is all electric um, and the Chrysler Pacifica is electric hybrid uh, car or pl plug-in hybrid car. Um, and you know the the IPACE represents the next generation. I think it's I think I, I can't make a commitment on where we are going to be with all of our future um, automotive partners, but the trend in the industry is very much aligned with what you're saying that deployment of EVs is going to be critical and it's important for the environment. It also is really helpful for the tech. What I didn't show you is that there's a big computer in all of those cars and it needs a lot of power too and that electrical energy is really, really helpful in making those those computers work well. Yeah, and that's why we need the investment in the grid. Um, so Carl Salas has a question. Uh, why did you pick Chandler uh, for your site? And he has a staff person there. And can he literally download the app and have a car pick him up? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. That staff person can download the app and have a car pick them up and take them. Carl, that's apps. pretty cool. Absolutely can happen right now. Um, okay. We chose Chandler um, because as the first place to launch this business for a couple of reasons. One, the regulatory environment was very favorable. And they were very eager. To, to see um, autonomous vehicles deployed there. Um, and so that in fact, the governor issued an executive order that made it, that cleared the path for us to be able to do this. And then that was turned into actual statute earlier this year. So Arizona has been very favorable uh, for us as a, on the regulation side. The, um, and also the, this Chandler, this, the community is very simple domains. We were talking about the complex domains earlier. It is a very simple one. It's a great place to start and to try out these new technologies with lots of straight streets. It doesn't go much over 45 miles an hour, I think. And so um, it's, it, was a, it was a good like, lineup of all of the things that we needed to, to start our business there. Thank you. Amanda? Like the surface streets, the yeah. So I think I think this is um, where the industry is. You know, we we can talk about where we are today and where we want to go. So where we want to go is just what you said. These trucks can do those tight turns and navigate those complex domains really easily, the technology is not there yet. Um, so in the short run, a lot of the companies are working focused on the long haul trucking part, which is the part that's hardest for truck drivers, right? It is the part that's hard on their bodies. It's hard to be away from home. It takes a really long, long, long time. Um, and I believe most of the industry will still need a way to sort of bridge from the interstate to the depot or the interstates to the warehouse. Um, and those are things that the industry is working for. I see. Hello, my governor. 
Okay, people online cannot hear that comment, so we'll just be moving on. <laughs> He's very bald, is what he said. Uh, so my, my question is, what is Lego worried about moving these jobs that are in Washington? It's a team that you bring to bring on and plus to the job. What is Lego doing? Steve's question is around drives and as um, these trucks come online and other cars come online, the jobs that will be impacted. So I think it's a, it's a great question um, and one that we're taking very seriously. I think the, the, the thing to remember is all of, while this technology exists today, as a widespread phenomenon, it's going to be a very, very, very long time before jobs, this, that level of jobs would potentially be displaced. Um, you know, we're talking about, a, we are the only company to have a commercial product in the market today, anywhere in the world, and that is in Chandler. And that's a really, really small market. So we have a really long, long, long time before, you know, this becomes a, a major significant issue. At the same time, we also know the Department of Transportation did a study recently. It talks about how many jobs are going to be created. Um, and they did the, the difference between job potential job loss and the number of jobs that are created. And it is actually in the net po positive side because there's a whole new opportunity. If you can remove, for example, long haul trucking, if you can remove the long haul part and then give people opportunities to do more short haul trucking, surface street work, working on the warehouse, learning the technology, working on maintenance, doing a whole bunch of different kinds of new new things, it can create a lot more opportunity. I think this is, it's a super important issue. It's one that we're taking seriously. We have a lot more time than I think people think we have before we have to answer that question um, with, a, with a solid answer. And in the meantime, the studies and the research shows that there could be a net plus benefit to jobs. Thank you, Lauren. I have two questions. Okay, make them For quick. First, very quick, uh, and I'm not as bald as Steve, but close. Um, what is the accident and death rate on Waymo driven cars as compared to the general rate? And are there any plans to go public? So the question is, are they planning to go public and what is the accident death rate so far um, in usage of Waymo? So I can't answer the second question, but I don't know. So there's that. She hopes but, I'll answer it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, the first question is about safety and the accident and death rate. And I'm glad you asked this question because it, we have a tremendous study that we just did in the city of Chandler, which is where the only commercial business is operating. We took all of the traffic fatalities for the last 10 years that occurred in Chandler, Arizona, and ran them through our simulator. We talked about that at the beginning ran it through the simulator and substituted one of the cars in the accident with a Waymo car, either the um, in, in, uh, inciting car or the receiving car, and did it for both, for all of the traffic fatalities for the last 10 years. And um, what happened was that the Waymo driver mitigated all of the fatalities. So it reduced fatalities to zero, and where there was an accident with an injury, the severity was significantly reduced. So the reality is most accidents, as we talked about before, are caused by human error and speeding, driving distracted, driving drunk, driving, you know, drowsy. All of those things contribute to it. When you replace one of the cars with a, a, a robot that is not going to do any of those things, you're, we're going to save millions of lives. Thank you. Before I thank Michelle for her time, I also want to let you know that this is going to take a major policy push. So if anybody is interested in this technology, we really need to make sure that our elected officials understand the importance of this, how this could um, positively impact our life, the concerns that you may have. That's the work that Michelle and her team do. So that is something that's really important. If you want to have more information, just reach out to me and I'll make sure to connect you. Thank you, Michelle, thank so much you. for your time. And here's Steve. Thank you, Janica and Michelle. And Michelle will be making a donation in your name to the Mineta Transportation Institute, and they'll help us solve all of the issues that come up as we're, as we're creating a whole new uh, way to transport people and things in, in our world. A couple quick announcements, and then I'll get you all out of here. 
Uh, Rich Agiloni, I think, is the chair of the Red Badge Committee. Rich, are you the chair? Rich, Rich, come on over to the microphone. Come on. Rich has a wonderful project Red Badgers are doing, and he'd like to make an announcement. Rich, come on up here. Or use Janica's microphone. While Rich is getting going on that, I have an announcement to make, which is there's a Van Gogh exhibit at the Blue Tent currently next to the convention center. And if you haven't seen it, you should go, go. This is one of the most magical art experiences you'll ever have. The music, the Van Gogh, I can't imagine anyone not liking Van Gogh's art. So that's just a personal recommendation. Get over and see Van Gogh. Rich. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, most of you have probably seen the carousel on across from the SAP Center on kind of Clarence Street or South Montgomery, North Montgomery. Um, it's, Barack Obama Boulevard. Sorry, Barack Obama Boulevard. It's dirty, it's dusty, it's in disrepair, and it hasn't been used in years. It's a disgrace. I mean, that's, that's our living room as a city, really, at such a visible spot. Anybody going into the SAP Center, driving by, visiting the park, it's in horrible condition. So our Red Badge Committee um, is going to be out there on Saturday, November 20th. Donuts at 8.30, cleaning starts at 9.00. And we're going to clean the animals, make sure the sound system works, get rid of the debris and the dust and the cobwebs, and they can shine. And maybe that's the first step in reactivating this community asset. In fact, right now, as we speak, there's a company over there power washing to get the big cobwebs and leaves and debris and stuff out of there. And I'll give you an update next week because it's a week from Saturday, November 20th. Again, uh, work starts at 9 o'clock, Saturday, November 20th, out there on the Alameda. And I'll give you a little more detailed instructions. Here. Thanks, Rich. Uh, thank you, Rich. Another announcement. We'll get you out of here. There are tickets to the San Jose State football game on your tables. Thank you, Dominic. Dominic, where are you? Wave your, wave your arm. Dominic's one of our new members. Maybe he had to leave. Wonderful young guy. Uh, take the tickets. Go to the game. It's really fun. A few of us went a couple weeks ago. With that, meeting adjourned. See you next week.